ID the Future, a podcast about evolution and intelligent design. Can near death experiences provide a robust scientific argument for consciousness at or after death? What are the best ways to evaluate near death cases? Welcome to ID the Future. I'm your host, Andrew McDermott. Today, my guest is Dr. Gary Habermas to discuss his chapter in the recent published book, Minding the Brain Models of the Mind, Information, and Empirical Science, available now from Discovery Institute Press Academic. Dr. Habermas is a distinguished research professor of apologetics and philosophy at Liberty University. He has dedicated his career to the examination of the relevant historical, philosophical, and theological issues surrounding the death and resurrection of Jesus. He has contributed more than 60 chapters or articles to books and has published over 100 articles and reviews in other publications. In recent years, he has been a visiting or adjunct professor at about 15 different graduate schools and seminaries in the United States and abroad. Dr. Habermas, welcome to ID the Future. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, by the way, that 60 figure you read on the on the uh, publications is now like 85. Oh, okay. Old news. Well, we'll need to update it, yeah. won't we? And you didn't use, you didn't use a books figure, but it's it's 50 books. Is it okay? You've contributed yep. to 50 books. Well, that's awesome. 50. Yeah, usually on the resurrection, but near death experience is probably the second or third topic I do the most research on. Wow. Yeah, well, you've contributed a chapter on evidential near-death experiences to the book Minding the Brain, which is a project from the Bradley Center on Natural and Artificial Intelligence at Discovery Institute. Now, for those who don't know about the book yet, Minding the Brain presents an array of perspectives on the mind-body problem, the idea that there are aspects of the mind that exist beyond the brain's biology. It's a topic that has captivated us since the dawn of human contemplation. Today, many insist that the mind is reducible to the brain. But is that claim justified? Well, that's what this book is all about. 25 philosophers and scientists offering fresh insight into that debate. And Dr. Habermas, you are one of them. Now, what got you interested in near-death accounts? And what prompted you to write a chapter evaluating NDE research? Well, many, many years ago, I uh, went through a period, an extended period of many, many years of doubt and questions about faith and could faith be demonstrated. And friends made uh, suggestions like, what do you think about the reliability of the New Testament? Or what about archaeology? Or, you know, what about creation? Or this or that. And I thought some of those topics had more evidence than others, but but I didn't think that any of them would, you know, by their by themselves show that Christianity was true. And then one day I read a suggestion in a book that if Jesus was raised from the dead and, and if God would have raised him, what other suggestion is there other than that he would have approved of Jesus' teachings, which by the way is is that comment that God approved Jesus' teachings by raising was found both in Acts 2 and in Acts 17. So I thought to myself, well, I don't know, if God raised Jesus from the dead, maybe that could show Christianity's true, but I didn't have a clue in those days whether there was any evidence for the resurrection. So that started me on a lifelong search on the resurrection, and from there I got into near-death experiences because, to me, near-death experiences, if this makes sense— are sort of an uh, an extenuation of the resurrection of Jesus in that they both occur in what we call the afterlife. So uh, I even thought about, you know, going here and there. If resurrection, then afterlife. If afterlife, we can argue backwards to the resurrection is something skeptics should be open to, because if you already know there's an afterlife, why wouldn't you take a look at the resurrection. So it can go forwards and backwards. So to me, the near-death experiences are an extenuation of my study of the resurrection of Jesus. Oh, very interesting. Now, you mentioned that as many as between 9 and 20 million people in the United States alone have had a near-death experience, and that these cases have generated a growing interest from scholarly communities. What are some of the reasons NDEs are getting more attention these last few decades? 
Well, I mean, you named one of them. That isn't that figure nine to twenty is actually in a book edited by a medical doctor, and every article, if I remember correctly, every article in that book was published in a medical journal, and then they were collected and published in a book by, I believe, the University of Missouri Press. So. You know, we're talking medical doctors. I think every author, I think, is an MD or a PhD. And the publisher was University of Missouri Press, and they were all published in a, in a medical journal. So right away it tells you, wow, you mean MDs and PhDs are paying attention? Yes. Okay, and how many people again? And you already gave the figure. They suggested 9 to 20 million people. So in other words, a lot of researchers and good minds with doctor's degrees, and secondly, 9 to 20 million. And I would say a third reason is because there are over 300 cases, well over 300 now. Uh, I, I did this in another, uh, another article for uh, Blackwell, which is a secular publisher in Oxford, England, and they claim to be the leading research press in the world. But uh, I did an article where I claimed that there's – five different categories of evidence for more than 300 evidence near-death experience. In other words, those 300 can be divided into five categories. That's probably a better way to say it. And so I'm sure not just the fact that medical doctors and PhDs are studying it. Secondly, millions and millions of people have had them. And third, there's good evidence. I, you know, and I think, I mean, even as atheists have said, a lot of people would like to live forever so it's a it's a topic that that, you know, kind of a tell me more kind of topic. People want to hear about it. And uh, when you got the evidence to go along with it, people start. Paying it. Well, one thing I really appreciate about your contribution to the book is that you frame your chapter as an evaluation of recent research into cases. And you bookend it with discussion of NDE skeptics. In the beginning, you right. refer. Yeah, you refer to a series of issues published in the Journal of Near-Death Studies back in 2007 and 8, featuring NDE researcher and skeptic Keith Augustine and the right. criteria standards that he sets for what he calls corroborated veridical recollections. Now, mm -hmm. can you tell us the types of evidence that skeptics like Augustine uh, prefer or look for? Yeah, now Augustine, I, I debated him years ago on a live, actually secular radio station in, I think, Houston, and so I got to know, I don't know where he is now, but years ago when we talked, nice guy, and we had a good discussion. I believe he's an agnostic. And he set some criteria. I mean, he and I have differences like this. I, I give five types of NDE evidence. I mean, real briefly, it's, it's evidence from inside the room, like in a hospital room, evidence from outside the room, like what if you see something out in the parking lot, like a car accident. Thirdly, NDEs in the blind, sometimes the, these uh, blind persons have not seen anything since birth, and the only time they've seen anything is during an NDE, and then they go back to being blind. But they can describe what they saw uh, almost as if they were looking at it visually. And then there's two categories of what I call twilight zone kinds of evidence, where one of them is where living people, like it could be a nurse, it could be a doctor, they say that they actually witnessed the same NDE that the patient did. They got to, I mean, the, the tunnel is not a super, I mean, it's not an experience everybody has, this famous tunnel. But they said they went down the tunnel with the patient or they could see the bright light in the room or they could see somebody coming into the room, a light to come through the ceiling and they saw it. That's a fourth kind. And the fifth kind is where, you see loved ones afterwards, which happens very frequently, but sometimes the person has been dead for a long time. Let's say a parent that's been dead for three years, they're, they're long buried, and there's an evidential discussion. I can give you some examples, but there's an evidential discussion where they give some information that presumably nobody on earth knows, and it, it can be checked out. And so those five categories, now back to your question about uh, Augustine, as I recall, and I think I cover it in that chapter, I think Augustine's favors uh, cooperation inside the hospital room. Now, I, that's fine. That's fine with me. I'll take it inside the room. But I think evidence outside the room is more impressive because inside a room, somebody could always say, well, your hearing is the last thing to go or 
Uh, they were resuscitating you and you saw a glimpse of the room during, you know, for a couple of seconds while they resuscitated you. I would much rather go with evidence outside the room. And in some of those cases, like the last one where you're with a loved one and they tell you something that's basically that people don't know and you explain it to the group and they go and check it out and it's true. But the person who told you has been buried for two or three years. I think I think the outside the room and the two or three years later type thing from a deceased individual, I personally, I think they're the most impressive kinds. But again, Augustine said, show me something inside a room. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a case where this woman was uh, operated on. And by the way, when I'm talking, I change a detail or two here and there just to keep from being, you know, someone saying, oh, I knew who that is. That's that's Mary or that's Fred, you know, but she was uh, operated on. And when it was over, the doctor came in to see her and he said, she, she asked if she got, if they got some good information on X, Y, Z. And he said, yeah, we got really good information because uh, the machine was recording while you were out and we've got data. And she said, yeah, that's my problem. Your machine was not on. And he said, uh, I beg your pardon. It was uh, plugged in. I'm just making up the place like uh, plugged in right at, the, right at the head of your bed. And she said, no, it wasn't. You go check. And he left and went and checked and came back. And to his chagrin, the machine was not plugged in. So that's a that's a case of evidence inside the room. Uh, another one is a famous case where a person looked down on top of a six or more foot high machine and saw a number up there that I guess they use in the hospital for finding out where this machine is, who's got it so they can get it. And there was a 12 digit number. And the person, when they came to, they told the nurses to write this down and they said, I'm OCD. So here's this 12 digit number up there. And they just said, well, okay, what's a 12 digit number? But later, the janitor came in and, I mean, a few, I guess a few days later, and they checked the thing out on top of the number she gave was correct. So those are inside the room. But then I, I like outside the room. Sometimes the outside the room ones are a mile or two miles away, and they can report a, an accident, something going on in their home. And I will tell you this, too, of all the categories of, of evidence in one book alone, there's over 100 evidenced near-death experiences, and three dozen of them are where the person to whom it happened had no measurable heart or brain activity. So what we would call colloquially a heart, you know, dead heart or, uh, you know, a heart attack or a flat, flat brain wave or flat heart waves. And so they had neither in about three dozen cases, and I'm sure that number's way up now, because this book came out, I'm guessing, almost 10 years ago. And they could give evidence of things they saw, like outside. Let's say they were in a windowless room, and they saw things out in the parking lot or something, but uh, according to everything we know from the tests we have, they had neither heart nor brain activity. So I think with those kind of cases, no heart or brain, and you report something outside, I'm just making this up, but I mean, like uh, maybe an accident in the parking lot. You have a police report that shows when the accident happened and when they got things straightened out. And if the person was gone before the accident and re and revived after the accident, that's a pretty good check on the data. And if they didn't have any heart and brain activity, I think we're talking about some pretty heavy evidence here. Absolutely. And it certainly uh, reduces the uh, argument that these are subjective, internal experiences only. Uh, exactly. So, yeah. Some of the distant vision accounts do stand out. I read some of them in your chapter. Uh, for example, in 1985, a red shoe was seen on a hospital roof yeah. uh, in an yeah. NDE, and that was later confirmed. Uh, there was a That's girl, correct. a girl named Crystal who almost drowned, and she recounted a visit to heaven but also the chance to see her family at home. And she was able to recount specific details that were later confirmed. And then there was a man yeah. who, who saw what his house sitter was doing in Florida, several states away from him at the time. Yeah, he was, that guy was up in Milwaukee. 
Yeah. These, these accounts are his, quite interesting. Yeah, the house fellow was in Florida, yep. So, yeah, and there, I mean, there's other cases where people, there, there's a case where, where a gal got her hair caught in a drain of a, of a pool, of a built-in pool, and she got her hair caught, and she was underwater for quite a long time, and they resuscitated her, but when the paramedics got there, it was a long process of working on her, and then, you know, getting her in an ambulance and getting her all the way to the hospital. Well, it was about 45 minutes, as I recall, in this one case. And she gave a, she later gave a blow by blow description of what happened to her, what they did, what the, and I have a couple cases in my own research where people were taken out to the ambulance. And, you know, on top of a lot of ambulances, if not all of them, I don't know, but on top of ambulances, there's often a large number so that it can be traced by like a helicopter if you're being airlifted somewhere. And I have had two cases where people re- correctly reported the number on the top of the ambulance, even though if you think of the kind of air- ambulances that we have that look like, uh, you know, vans, a person on a gurney would be, what, three three feet below that number. And they're not standing up, so they could not have seen any number on top of the especially if they were comatose, you know. So, and they correctly reported the number on top of the ambulance because they said they were looking down on it and, and saw it right away. So uh, that was one of the cases I used with Keith Augustine in the when he and I dialogued many years ago. So, I mean, there are, they have 300 evidential cases, and I'll bet you that number is, I'm just guessing, I haven't looked for a long time, but it's probably well over 400. To have that many evidential cases You've got, as the old saying goes, you've got different strokes for different folks. I mean, just about everything you can think of, an unplugged machine, a number, you know, seeing somebody out in a parking lot where you're in a windowless room inside or uh, seeing a case and where you said, you know, your dad or somebody appeared to you in heaven and he'd been deceased for several years and he uh, gave you some information that could only be corroborated later. And everybody was just flabbergasted, but the guy learned it during his NDE, and he said he was talking to his dad. So you're totally right. The first thing that goes on these explanations are are totally subjective ones. Critics, you know, atheists, agnostics like to say, oh, yeah, sounds like a dream to me, or sounds like an hallucination, or sounds like, uh, what were you drinking, or whatever. But none of those subjective explanations can explain sight between Milwaukee and Florida or, you know, what happened out in the parking lot when you're in a windowless room or why your machine was unplugged down the hall during the surgery that the doctor thought was plugged in. There's many of these people dropping things on the floor during surgery and, and then kind of blowing up like glass blowing up all over. But the person watched it. They told who dropped it, who it was that pointed it out and so on. And they were all right in the details when they did interviews. Yeah. Or, or like I said, like I said, the, the young girl who was uh, gave a description of the 45 minute resuscitation and uh, taking her to the hospital. And some of the naturalistic explanations that are put forward include things like, oh, the information was learned from other means or it was a case of misperception or deception or coincidence or mistake. But yeah. as you say in the chapter, it's unlikely that every last one of these hundreds of documented evidential NDEs could be explained in those ways. Right. And I mean, they're just not in the room, out of the room, down the hall, 100 miles away, two miles away. Uh, A person who's been buried for two years who gives information that everybody in the family needed, and now they've got it. Uh, Like where something important was put away that they hadn't found for two or three years. All of that kind of of stuff, the, the angles from which it comes, the varieties from which it comes, there, it, all the subjective, to me, subjective explanations, because we deal with that with the resurrection too, you know, the disciples saw hallucinations. And we're saying, nah, because our earliest sources from the 30s AD after the cross said that Jesus appeared to groups, and that's a real problem for hallucinations. Well, uh, they're like that here too. When you have groups seeing this, sometimes, like I said, the fourth area is that there's a healthy person who witnesses the experience of the near-deceased, what we call near-dead, 
the NDE, the a healthy person who did, who witnesses what the what the uh, near dead person sees. And uh, so it, it, to me, it comes from way too many angles to be only one, two, three or four times of, you know, some people say it's the it's the uh, medicine you took. The medicine did this or that to you. Yeah, but medicines don't allow correct perception at a mile away. Right. You know, so, yeah, I, th- I think we've covered the bases. In fact, I um, <laughs> I told my editor who edited my chapter for that book, he's a physicist and, of course, very interested in intelligent design and fine-tuning type arguments. <laughs> I told him I must have been in a, in a bold mood one day, but I told him, I said, I think there's enough data for NDEs that would rival the things you folks find for ID and fine tuning. There's just a lot of detail. So when you put these three together, think of it this way. When you talk about natural theology, something that says religion is true, but not necessarily Christianity, necessarily a, a religion. You've got, you think of categories like intelligent design, fine tuning. And now I, I would add near death experiences to it. These are, these are categories that tell us there's order in the world and everything has to be just right for these occasions. And now it looks like there's an afterlife. You put that all together, you're starting to get a picture that's looking like pretty interesting theology. Yeah. Well, later in your chapter, you distinguish between acts taking place in this world in NDEs that can be independently corroborated and also right. acts that take place in a heavenly or other world or realm. Why is that an important yeah. distinction here when you're studying the scientific case for these? Yeah, because I don't trust the latter. <laughs> I don't trust the latter, whether they're by Christians or non-Christians. Now, for example, people can say, I had this wonderful feeling. I felt just fantastic. I wanted to go back there. I didn't even want to return. Well, that that's cool. I mean, you know, I'm not going to question your emotions, but <laughs> there's no, there's no uh, evidence that you had a description with an angel, let's say, or you met Jesus. And in one recent book that just came out, in the ears of all the religious figures in the world, in the ears see Jesus more frequently than any other person. 20% of in the ears in this study that you just published, 20% of in the ears see Jesus. And the other religions, as I recall, there were no no more than three reports of a Buddhist a Buddhist person, a, a Hindu person, anybody else. No more than three, but of Jesus is twenty percent. There were one hundred NDE cases, so Jesus was seen twenty times, and the nearest the nearest any other religious founder was was three times. So uh, that says something about Christianity, but I still don't I don't use that as a reason because. If you say I had a discussion with Jesus and he said to me, this is not your time. I'm sending you back. Someday you'll be here. But until then, goodbye. And you're back in your body. Well, how do I confirm a heavenly discussion? Or for that matter, a discussion in hell. About 20% of near-death experiences are hell cases. Yeah, I should explain that. Either hell or something very, very, very uncomfortable. It could be like like depression, big time depression or anxiety or fear or, but it could be like a hell like environment, like a burning lake of fire, just like you read about in the Bible. And someone could say, Oh, that's because you were raised that way. Well, that's my problem. I can't verify heavenly discussions or heavenly sites. So the kind of NDE data I'm talking about virtually always occur on this earth in normal kind of situations, I'm using, I've used examples like parking lots, uh, you know, in your home, two miles away, normal earthly situations. That's where the evidence comes from. And it would seem that, you know, a lot of naturalists or those looking for naturalistic explanations are ultimately gunning for religion. It's the religion part they don't like about NDEs. And so that's what's nice about the study of these is you can separate the corroboration of certain things versus things that you can't corroborate. And I think that that's an important distinction to make. In fact, Michael Michael Sabom, uh, a fellow NDE researcher, has said that yep. religious beliefs appear to affect the interpretation, but not the content of the near-death experience. 
Yeah, he's a cardiologist. He used to teach at Emory University in Atlanta. Then he went into private practice. I know Mike real well, and uh, he's a he's a really committed Christian too. But he's one of the best in the old days when NDE research first started. He was one of the quote unquote big five. There were five scholars who were very well known in those early days, and he was one of the first of the five of five guys that published this. And he published the first book, and some still say the best book on a uh, medical investigation of NDEs where you scientifically look at it. And he gave, I think, six, six evidential cases. But I mean, he's got six cases in that book. One person read a dial on a machine in their room. But you know, when you're out and the thing is up behind your head and you're lying down on the bed, face up, and the machine's behind you, you can't read the you know, you're out. They're they're cutting you. You're 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 out. You can't tell them what the dial on the what the dial on the machine said. But that was one of the his five. But you think about that. He put he did five, and now this article I did years ago and for Blackwell, and then this one I did for um, Discover, over three hundred then, and probably three fifty or four hundred now. They make Mike Sabom six look like nothing, and Mike would probably say that too. Uh, so we just have we just have a lot of evidence. And to me, the only thing that makes sense that, that there's so many evidences from so many angles about the only thing that makes sense is for the skeptic to say something like, well, you're just kind of mamby pamby. You believe anything you got. You just got soft emotions. I, I'm a hard case. I, I don't believe that stuff. Yeah. All you're telling me is that you don't want to believe it. That's all your, your, your comment that made it sound like you're a tough guy and, and everybody else is like, like, uh, you know, a feelings person. Philosophically, you're telling me about your worldview. You're telling me about the way you think the world is. And if you think there's nothing supernatural in the world, well, you go right on having that belief. You're not going to change this NDE evidence, but uh, a lot of people who say they don't believe it, it are people who don't want it to be true. They don't want God to pick one example. They don't want there to be a God that has a claim on their life and asks them what they were doing during their life. They don't, they don't want to be a part of that. So many, many times the deniers are people who just say, yeah, whatever. But, but the point is they can't, exp they cannot explain the data from, you know, dozens of positions and in and out of the room and blind and these twilight zone healthy person you know, goes with them. And the ones where you meet a, a deceased person who's, you can go to their grave and see the place where they're buried. And they, and you, and your testimony is, you know, you say it was your father. Yeah. Okay. Well, you tell me who it is when I got this information from him. And when it was over, I went out and checked it out. It was true. Now who, now who looks like they're telling the truth? Yeah. And it's, it's certainly that verifiable objective data that strengthens the scientific case for near-death experiences. Well, exactly. One or two questions as we wrap up. Did you participate in the Angel Studios documentary feature film After Death that's coming out? <laughs> Actually, I think I did. I, I, I to say I think I did sounds kind of weird. I, I've done. I did two movies recently that it, they were both a part. I was a, a part of each one. One on near-death experiences, and one on the Shroud of Turin. And uh, I'm pretty sure the one was the Angels publication. In fact, my wife and I are planning to go see the movie this week. It comes to our town, to our movie uh, theater. Okay. So. Yeah. Well, in general, this is my final question. Why is it important to share with the wider public the evidence for afterlife consciousness? Well, you know, I, I think for a lot of reasons, the afterlife is very, very important. And if there's an afterlife, especially, I mean, you could see it in simplistic terms where there could be a, a bad place and a good place, call it whatever you want, describe it however you want. I don't believe the, the descriptions, you know, I talked to an angel, Jesus said I'd come back in 20 years. I don't, I don't believe those kind of reports because I have no way to verify them. I, don't, I only believe what I can verify. However, if there's an afterlife of some sort and and people want to believe in an afterlife, it not only is is a fascinating view. I mean, how many things on your list would be higher that you'd like to know about than an afterlife? But secondly, 
it's a question that gets going in your own life. What if a person gets really convicted, realizes I'm an agnostic or a non-Christian, uh, somehow I'm an atheist, but now all this evidence, I can't refuse it. Now there's an afterlife. Well, I better start paying attention to the world religions and where I ought to go and where the evidence is because I better get ready for this event before it happens. So it's such a momentous thing. Who doesn't want to live forever? It's such a momentous possibility that it can it can lead a person onto a path of discovery and research on their own and, and going where they think the evidence leads. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for your time and sharing your insights and the research and this awesome chapter you've contributed. Well, thank you, Andrew. I appreciate that. Uh, I enjoy doing it, and I'm glad they did it. I've got to do another one for another book coming up pretty soon. It's another Blackwell book. So that's that would be, you know, three detailed articles. That That's just an example. These things are popping up, and people want to do interviews, and people want me to write. I'm, I'm an editor, by the way, for the uh, uh, review editor for the Journal of Near-Death Studies, which is, I think they claim, the only – the only peer-reviewed near-death journal in the world that comes out of University of Virginia School of Medicine, I think is where it was born. So it's got all the credentials of a, of a really good research report, and I've been an editor there for, I don't even know, over 10 years. And so, I mean, they're just they're just out there, and you come into a lot, lot of detail. I think it's just an exciting area, and I'm, I, I want to keep the ball rolling. So thank you for doing the interview. Absolutely. And if listeners are interested in more of your work, they can access it at your website, GaryHabermas.com. GaryHabermas.com. And uh, folks, if you're interested in this book, it's an awesome uh, array of perspectives on the mind-body issue. You can get more information at Discovery.org. Just type in Minding the Brain and you'll get free chapter excerpts, endorsements, and of course links to purchase your own copy. Well, until sure. next time... I am Andrew McDermott for ID the Future. Thank you for listening. Visit us at idthefuture.com and intelligentdesign.org. This program is Copyright Discovery Institute and recorded by its Center for Science and Culture.